this session, what I would like to go over is I would like to go over the structure of a Bitcoin transaction. This is um, the way in which we move Bitcoin from one party to another party. It's the place where the cryptography that we've looked at previously um, it comes into play. And it's the, um, it requires sort of understanding at a high level the structure of the transaction, and then what we'll do is we'll go online and we'll look at the details of a specific transaction. Um, those transactions, of course, are put together in a collection which is called a block, and that block forms one page of the ledger, which is the blockchain. So we have a blockchain which is online. The blockchain is comprised of many different transactions that are on it. So what I want to do is not talk about the block right now, but talk about the individual transactions that um, appear in a block. Okay, Bitcoin doesn't work exactly like a wallet. So if I have a wallet and someone says, hey, can I have two bucks uh, for a soda or a candy bar or something? And I say, sure, I can just go into my wallet and I can say, oh, here's, here's two dollars, here's a dollar, and here's a dollar. Great, here's two dollars. Here you go. You can take it and do whatever you want with it. So provided the agreement's fine with me, uh, those two dollars can be taken and spent however um, the person wants. Bitcoin's a little different than that because you never actually hold something uh, which is Bitcoin. Uh, you never have like some token or you never have some um, like, like um, bits or something that represent the dollars that are equivalent to uh, Bitcoin or that you can exchange for Bitcoin. Instead, what you have is you have rights, and you have rights in order to move Bitcoin um, from one place to another place. And so what's a little bit unusual about the way the Bitcoin transaction is structured is it's not structured as who gets the Bitcoin that I have. Instead, what it is, is it's structured as a movement of rights from a previous rights holder to a subsequent rights holder, and it's denominated in Bitcoin. All right, so let me, let me draw a picture for you to sort of uh, flesh that out a little bit. So if I want to pay someone two bitcoins for something, here's what I need to do in the scope of a transaction. First of all, we're going to give the transaction a name, and it's going to be a name that's amenable to cryptographic functions, but for now we're just going to leave it blank. We're going to say there's some transaction, it's the one that we're currently constructing, and it's going to have some name, but we'll determine that in a second. So the first thing that we need to do is if we want to send someone a given amount of bitcoins, we have to say, okay, well, where are those bitcoins going to come from? And all of the bitcoins, the transactions, are publicly known where they've moved from and to. Those, those locations and transfers are all on the um, blockchain. And so what we need to do, first of all, is we need to identify the places from which those bitcoins have come. Um, and in a transaction, you can uh, put together many different locations where they've come from. So let's say that we want to transfer um, three Bitcoin to, to one person, um, and we're going to use three Bitcoin that we've received previously. So unlike the dollars, where as soon as we get the dollars, we kind of forget about where the dollars came from or who gave us that specific dollar and who gave us that specific dollar, we kind of ignore that. In Bitcoin, there's always a connection between who gave us that Bitcoin um, before we put it together to pass it on to the next person. So if we want to send someone three um, Bitcoin, we need to say, well, where did we get, specifically, where did we get those three Bitcoin? So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to list the inputs. And in each input, we're going to list the transaction that generated the Bitcoin. So this will, we'll call it, we'll use computer science notation and say this is transaction zero. Um, in, com in computer science notation, the first thing is zero, not one. The second transaction will be one. And for this example, we're going to have three transactions. So zero, one, and two. And the sum of those is going to be enough that we can give our Bitcoin to someone, okay? So we want to give three Bitcoin to someone, so let's go ahead and specify the output abstractly. And we're going to say that these are the outputs. And this is going to be a new transaction, um, and we'll just talk about it abstractly, and we'll say it's transaction three. So what's going to happen is this whole thing is going to be represented digitally. And what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, these three things we're going to combine them, and then that's going to become our output. 
if we want to send three bitcoins, we have to be able to locate three places where we have bitcoin, and we need to send it to the output. Now there's a couple things, there's some housekeeping and some details here. So the first thing is, is let's say that the sum of all of these transactions gives us um, A bitcoins. And let, let's say that the sum of our outputs is B bitcoin. So we have a, a couple different situations. If, um, well first of all we know that A has got to be greater than B, greater than or equal to B. If A is not greater than or equal to B, this is an invalid transaction and it's not going to be accepted by the um, blockchain, by the rest of the peers that are evaluating the blockchain, because you have to have at least as many Bitcoin coming in as you want going out. The next thing is that if A is greater than B, then the difference between A and B is going to be equal to the transaction fee. So let's say that the sum of all of these adds up to actually 3.5 Bitcoin, and the designated amount that we're sending out only adds up to 3 Bitcoin. That means that the transaction fee for this transaction is going to be equal to 3.5 minus 3, or 0.5 Bitcoin. When you specify a transaction like this, any Bitcoin that's not accounted for explicitly in this movement from inputs to outputs is assigned as a transaction fee. When this transaction gets bundled with other transactions and put into a block, whoever successfully mines that block not only gets the reward for mining the block, but also has the rights to collect all of the uh, Bitcoin, all of the transaction fees that are, or that are there, all right, that, that have been, uh, that are left over in all of the transactions. Okay, uh, and oftentimes, because the granularity of your inputs and the granularities of your outputs don't match very well, uh, you have to specify another output. And just like you can have multiple inputs, you can have multiple outputs. So let's say that you really feel that 0.5 Bitcoin is too high of a transaction fee, but these inputs still add up to 3.5, and you only want to send 3 to your friend. So typically what's done in a straightforward transaction is another output is added here. And this, this output is, is called your change. It's like getting change when you buy something with a bill that's too large and you're given back coins, uh, which is the balance of whatever you didn't spend. So a lot of times what will happen is if I want to send three Bitcoin in this transaction to someone else, um, I put the remainder of that transaction because I want it all accounted for in a transaction that goes back to me again. So this is like a transaction that I can use as an input in the future sometime. Okay, so we know that um, we can have multiple inputs to a transaction, those get bundled together, and then they're assigned to multiple outputs. So in the general case, you can actually send um, your outputs to more than one person in one given transaction. Um, the common case is that you send it to one person and then you send the change back to yourself and then there's a little bit left over for a transaction fee. That's the common case. Multiple inputs and two outputs with a little bit of change left over. Now, in this, I haven't talked at all about where the conditions are for ensuring that people just can't take bitcoins. And so the rules for who's allowed to take inputs and, to who to, um, and for specifying to whom the outputs are given are specified in this transaction as well. And basically the idea there is when I specify an output, in addition to saying how much I want to spend, how much I want to spend, how much I want to send, um, I also get to specify the conditions of the of the person who gets to claim them. And so this is where the this is where we use that public private key knowledge that we've talked about in order to specify the conditions. So the common case is that what you can do here is you say, okay, I am going to say that um, only the person that has the private key that matches the public key, which I'm going to put in the, um, in the transaction itself, is allowed to take those bitcoins. So I'm going to use the public-private key trick 
that we've, that we've, the public private key encryption strategies that we've used in order to say that you must produce the private key in order to be able to take these transactions. And we'll show how that's done when we go online. Okay, likewise on the input, if these are the conditions that must be met, here when you, when you specify that you're going to use something as an input, you've got to specify your proof that you meet the conditions that were specified in this input. Okay, because the outputs from one transaction just become the inputs to the next transaction. So when I place conditions on the output, I have to validate that I've met the conditions on the input to this transaction. So if this says that, oh, you must have the private key that matches the public key, which I'm going to provide in the transaction, well, over here then, you need to, you need to um, prove that you have the private key. in order to be able to take these um, bitcoins uh, and move them in, in your transaction. So this is an overall structure of what a transaction looks like. A transaction, oh, and then the last thing is that we have to name this thing. So once we have specified where all our inputs are coming from, we've identified that we have the proof that's necessary in order to take these inputs, to combine them, and once we've specified who we want these um, Bitcoins to go to, our primary payer maybe, change, which also has conditions. They're, they're so similar. And then whatever's left over goes to the miner that solves the block in which this transaction occurs. Once we do all that, we're going to wrap all that up, and this is all going to become one big digital message. And then the name of our transaction is going to be a hash of our message. Um, and in the most recent code, the hash of the message is actually the SHA-256 hash. Oops. Of the SHA-256 hash of the message. So in general abstract terms, you can just think we're taking a hash of the message. The actual hash functions that we're using is a hash of a hash of them. This bit then becomes the name. And that name is the way that we specify this transaction. So this transaction is going to have a name. And when we, tr when we reference a transaction, rather than saying transaction near zero, we're going to name the transaction that we're using as the input. And when we specify the output, there won't be a name on the transaction, because the transaction name has to be created by the person who's going to meet the conditions of this output. Okay, so abstractly this is what we've got, inputs, outputs, conditions are specified on the outputs, the, the meeting the conditions is required for each of these inputs if you're going to try and construct a good transaction, that transaction gets a name and that name is a hash of this entire function and that's going to go up in the top. That's a general transaction, sort of the typical one. In each block though, there's one special transaction and that tra transaction is called the Coinbase transaction. And the Coinbase transaction is the first transaction that occurs in the block. And the thing that's unique about the Coinbase transaction is it doesn't have any inputs. It doesn't have any inputs because the inputs for the Coinbase transaction is the reward that's granted to the person who can successfully close that block by providing the right nonce. So the first transaction is whatever the, wherever the miner wants to send the reward for closing that block. So otherwise, it looks the same. There are still outputs. The outputs have conditions on them. Um, there can be uh, you know, there could be multiple outputs, and, and actually it's kind of a special case for the transaction fee. It would be silly to have a transaction fee left over because that transaction fee would also get rolled into, I, I guess there can't be a transaction fee. That's sort of a detail. So the sum of these have to be equal to the reward. 
for closing that block. There are conditions on each of the outputs that they go to, and then they can be used as inputs in subsequent transactions. All right? So Coinbase, a special transaction. There's one of them per block. Uh, otherwise, the transactions all have inputs and outputs. Thanks. Okay, now let's go online to actually look and see the details of that happening in the blockchain.